So with that, let's let's get uh, let's get into it straight away. Uh, transparency and trust in the food chain. I put a lot of materials in here for you, and uh, I'm taking it that people are coming at this from different angles. We have academics on the line, we have professors, we have CEOs of companies, uh, and we have uh, people who are uh, uh, students, and we also have um, uh, people who are interested in the topic. We also have technology, a lot of technology people and standards people as well. So with that, um, let me go into the agenda here. I'll talk about food chain complexity and the first slide that I'll talk about will really set the scene for uh, what I'm going to talk about in food chain transparency and trust. Then I'll go into transparency and trust individually and separately. Uh, I'll talk about a new supplier challenge um, and we'll pause on that for a few moments. I'll introduce technology complexity and I'll focus deeply on blockchain. And then after that, I'll give you some insights and some tips and tools on uh, things that I've been using for many years that you, you may find very useful. And then I'll summarize the, uh, the briefing. Now on this one here, on transparency and trust in the food chain, th these are the challenges that we have. And if you look at this slide, I've been using this for a dozen years. It really shows you that we're in a very complex world, but I've simplified it here on this chart, or, or this is actually adapted from Gemini from back in uh, 03. So if you look at the, the meal on the right hand side, you see some fish, you see potatoes, and you also see um, things like uh, vegetables. Let me let Dan in here. Okay. Uh, and you see the supply chains coming out of that. So the yellow line here is uh, uh, potatoes. And it, you know, we buy the potatoes from the retailer, let's say the mall, they buy them from a wholesaler, uh, and they come from a packing house and they come from a farm. This is a very simplified version of the supply chain. But if you look at the complexity of uh, the fish supply chain here, the orange line, you see that there's much, much more involved in that. Now, this gets complex because our, global, our supply chain is global, of course. And we have lots of countries involved. We have lots of different languages. We have uh, thousands of different technologies. And in fact, a lot of companies may not even use technologies if they're smallholders. And we also have different regulations and different uh, interpretations of transparency. So transparency in some countries may be seen as, uh, as a threat. So that's uh, a big risk that, uh, that we run. We, we, we may assume that transparency is goodness and that everyone sees it as goodness, but unfortunately, that's not the same in some regimes around the world. So the issues that we want to address in this um, are things like what species of fish is this that I have on my plate? Is it wild or farmed salmon? So I paid a, an extra uh, premium for wild, but is it really wild salmon? Uh, is the animal feed safe? Is my milk diluted or adulterated? And we had issues with this in North America last year. One of our top brands uh, for soya milk admitted that there was cow's milk in the soya milk, which uh, things that just shouldn't happen. And is my food really organic or is there heavy metal contamination in my food? Uh, and then as you build this picture, you're talking about things like, is my honey pure, adulterated? Uh, and sometimes here you have the issue with uh, the different technology. Technology to test food is advancing at a significant pace, much, much faster pace than industry can catch up with, uh, to be honest. So as, uh, as some uh, analytical scientists will say, if you look for food fraud, uh, food adulteration, you'll find it. But there's other things that we need to, we need to figure out as well, because uh, for example, is there pork in my halal? And this has uh, obviously got significant religious uh, implications for, for Muslims and the same for, uh, for kosher foods. And what is the nutritional profile for my food? Is it 100% uh, beef? And at the bottom here, I, I'm, I'm talking about rice. Is this rice really, uh, this coffee really from Vietnam or is it from somewhere else? Uh, ultimately, what we want to know is, is the food safe to eat? Now, as I'm pointing out here at the bottom, one of the bigger things that we've forgotten about is, is that natural sciences enable transparency and trust with objective certainty in terms of uh, the ability to ascertain and verify characteristics of food products. So we still see today a lot of technology companies that will claim that they can guarantee provenance of fish or of products. And, and to a certain extent, they can in very close supply chains. But I want to sensitize you to this, that the natural science, science is the critical component here, and it's not getting enough respect or, or, or credence in, in the whole picture. So, and I'll keep coming back to this later, because natural sciences is the only way to prove with certainty 
that a product is what it says it is or where it's actually from. And let me give you just one example. So in Vietnam, uh, where I used to live, uh, local farmers may buy cheap carrots from uh, China and they wet the carrots, they roll them in the local dirt and try to sell them as, as uh, uh, Vietnamese carrots. Now, if you put that on a blockchain, for example, then you're, you're claiming that the provenance is Vietnam. However, if you bring it to a laboratory and you do a carbon-13 analysis of that, it'll tell you that the species is indigenous to China and it was physically grown in China. So I just want to make that dis distinction. Data provenance and scientific provenance are two very, very different things. So on transparency itself, so it's, it's about sincerity, clarity, it's about honesty, believability of the data and accuracy. And I'll keep coming back to this by, by showing you some examples of where companies are not doing this very well and others are doing it with best intentions, but it's also failing. Now, my favorite academic uh, is Kirtjan Hofstede. He's a professor at University of Wageningen in Holland. And his father is Kirt Hofstede, who's very famous for the cultural studies in the 1980s. And, and what Professor Hofstede talks about here, he talks about a net chain, which is a network and a supply chain. But the definition he gives of transparency is, um, well, let, me, let me add someone here, admit. Okay, uh, he, he talks about the definition of, of transparency as uh, the extent to which all of the net chain stakeholders have a shared understanding of and access to product related information that they request without loss, noise, delay, or distortion. Now, to do this justice, I would need to spend an hour on this and go into every part of the detail, all of the highlighted words here. But safe to say the shared understanding uh, brings up things like uh, GS1 standards and the ability to be able to, uh, to agree on how we're going to call products, how we're going to name them, the distinctions between master data and transactional data. And of course, if you don't have access to the data, it, uh, it negates uh, the benefits of it. And it's information that they request. And I'll give you one example of why this is important. I spoke with a CEO of a company in, uh, in, in Shanghai, and she tried to be radically uh, transparent by sharing with, uh, with her customers, who are typically the moms, um, the analytical laboratory test results. I don't know, it was 16 or 18 pages of test results that they shared with the moms, just to say that, hey, look, we're doing the right thing here. Because in China, trust in food is, is very low. But the feedback from the moms was counterintuitive for them. The mom said, we didn't ask for it. We don't need it. And you know what? You scared the crap out of us. So that's, that was a lesson learned for that company to put a lot of effort into sharing that information, but it wasn't actually requested. And the lost noise, delay, or distortion can be caused by a lot of things, lack of a shared understanding again, but also a lack of interoperability, a lack of standards, and, and marketing, where they're adding some additional stuff that's not really relevant to the product. And we, we all make jokes about uh, gluten-free water, gluten-free tomatoes, and, and things like that. But what Professor Hofstede says, if information is the lifeblood of an organization, then it's transparency that enables it to flow. So even if you have a product that's relatively simple, like a, uh, an apple, yes, I think it is important to let the consumers know where the apple was grown and, and if it was modified. So if you do any genetic modification on a product, I think the consumer needs to, uh, to know that. So I was working with this model, and this is a work in progress, just to give you another example of uh, transparency. So see the blue line here, you have transparency on the right, and you have opacity or darkness on the left-hand side. And the driver of that from a business perspective is competitiveness. So that will determine what you want to share and what you want to keep as a secret. But on the top, regulation is also a driver of disclosure and a driver of transparency. And what, what I've called it here is secrets and, and truth. So for example, the regulator will tell you that uh, because of the risks of insider trading, you should not uh, share financial data before it's announced to everyone broadly and at the same time. So that's an example where the regulator says, do not share. And of course, on the, uh, on the truth side, regulators want you then when you do report that the information is truthful and it's accurate. And the same in food, if, you're, if the regulator is asking you to declare something like allergens and so on, it has to be truthful. Consumers also expect it, and in business, they expect it. So some of the things that industry could decide to keep secrets are things like their IP, specifications, recipes. Coca-Cola is not going to tell you what the formula is for their Coca-Cola, and rightly so. 
a lot of companies will keep their suppliers uh, confidential and of course their customers, their costs, their margins, R&D and quality is just an example. And when you get into the next box here of trusted uh, B2B, companies will share uh, some of this information with their trading partners or with their business partners where they're doing co-development. And then you have untrusted uh, B2B where you're just doing transactional buying uh, from those parties and you're sharing limited information. And on the right hand side, you have companies that are actually doing what's called radical transparency. And I'll show you an example of that in a few moments where they've decided that they're going to share all of their suppliers. They're going to share their costs and their margins. And this is really a unique, a unique scenario. And of course, we know that companies want to be clear about their environmental uh, footprint, uh, whether they're involved in slavery uh, or whether they've checked and validated that there's no slavery in their supply chain and also uh, issues around animal welfare, child labor, and so on. So what I've done is here, I, I've, I've taken the, uh, the information from uh, Professor Hofstede and I put it into this model here. And he really talks about three, three levels of transparency. The first one at the bottom is history-based transparency. And when you look at that, it's like looking in your rear view mirror. It's looking at what has happened in the supply chain and things that are covered in there are typically traceability and information that you would just share. Now, as you move up from that mandatory requirement to share that information, to capture it and share it, you get into operations-based uh, transparency where you're sharing from a B2B perspective, and then you move up into what's called strategic or strategy-based transparency, where the focus is on the future and you're sharing bi-directional information, which could include uh, info on market entry, new products, co-development, joint ventures, licensing, and, and even things like the recipes and formulas and so on. So that's a real close strategic relationship. So the, my point here is that you have different levels and aims uh, in, in transparency. And here's a good way to, uh, to frame that history-based transparency, operations-based transparency, and strategy-based transparency. And as I mentioned on the CSR, there are abuses and overuses of transparency. So on the left-hand side, there's one article, corporations use transparency claims to cultivate the impression of full disclosure. And we know that that's not always the case. And what Professor uh, Graham Bullock uh, talked about, 56% of Americans still do not trust companies' green claims. So look, while companies want to be transparent and they're sharing information about their environmental footprint or about their green trust, uh, consumers are just not buying it. So there's a, a trust uh, deficiency in there. And part of that problem is uh, what, if you look on the right hand side here, what I've highlighted uh, in red, uh, Professor uh, Bullock looked at 245 different credence claims, or eco label, sustainability ratings, and so on. And of all of those, he only found one that had a good balance between transparency, independence, and expertise. And what that really means is that while most companies were focused on being transparent, yes, we have this certification, they were less transparent about their internal expertise. Was it a master's degree person? Was there a peer review done on the, on the results? And were they actually independent of the organization that was doing the uh, certification claim? So, Brilliant, uh, brilliant study uh, if you want to look into that. And on the left-hand side here, what Coombs and Holiday found is that the reality in a lot of companies is that the minority of the activist stakeholders are the ones that really force the organizations to be truthful in, uh, in what they disclose to the market. And of course, remember Enron and WorldCom, they were very, very transparent, but it was with false information. And we know now that uh, as a result of what they did, uh, we have the Sarbanes-Oxley uh, Act. So on the next one here, this is the example of the uh, radical transparency that I talked about earlier. This is uh, on supply chain cost information where Everlane, they're a retailer in the US, online retailer, and they disclose everything about their costs as well as the margins that they make in the supply chain. So that's an extreme uh, case. And what I want to point out here is that uh, transparency can be voluntary, it can be mandated by regulation, but it can also be involuntary. And here's the case where Apple, uh, I don't want to say got caught, but were exposed, where the economist uh, exposed all of the costs of the Apple iPhone uh, components and then, uh, and then uh, claimed that here's the margin that they, uh, they actually have. 
and also in a Beijing based institute of public environment and environmental affairs, they disclosed information about the treatment of workers. So the point here is that you have voluntary based uh, transparency, you have mandated transparency and you have involuntary. So if you're making some uh, errors in the supply chain, uh, there are these third party organizations who act as like police patrols and try to keep organizations uh, honest. Now on trust, trust is a very interesting one. And uh, uh, Rousseau got together with several other academics from the top uh, universities in, in the US and they defined uh, a multidisciplinary uh, definition of, of trust as a psychological state comprising of the intention to accept a vulnerability based upon positive expectations of the intentions or behaviors of another. So think of uh, that meal on the first, uh, the very first slide and think of you going into a restaurant. So when you go into a restaurant, you're actually accepting a vulnerability and you have a positive expectation that everyone in the supply chain from the farmers to the distributors, to the retailers, right down to the chefs in the uh, restaurant, uh, you have a positive expectation that the intentions and behaviors of them were based on your best interests. Now we know that that's not always the case, but we actually trust upfront. Then transparency comes after that and trust comes after that again. So what we actually say is that uh, trust is both an antecedent of transparency and also an outcome. In other words, we are trusting by nature and we accept risk within society and in all of the things that we do. So that's an important one. Trust is both an antecedent of transparency and then transparency can further enhance trust if it's clear, truthful, and, and honest. But unfortunately, uh, we can't believe all of these things because we know that we have a significant problem with uh, food fraud, food adulteration, and other issues in the supply chain, product safety issues, uh, quality issues. So this again is where analytical science comes in and is our best friend. So trust but verify is uh, critically important for us. Now I want to share you this model again, and I'm going to overlay uh, Hofstede onto this. So history-based transparency. And if you look at the different maturity levels within a supply chain, you can look at a supply chain where there's limited trust and you're sharing just basic information uh, with them. Now I've just highlighted a red box here, just to give you an example. It's very simple information that's been shared. There's limited uh, trust between the parties. And then as you move up to transactional based trust, more of what, what Hofstede would say the operations based transparency, where you're sharing information about order histories or forecasts, and you're doing actually more uh, uh, business relationship. Now look at the bottom here. This is, uh, this is a part of time experience and the relationship intensity. So as you invest more in your B2B relationships, you get up to what's called relationship trust and then up to collaborative trust. And this is what, uh, what Hofstede talks about and what he implies with strategic-based uh, transparency, where you're sharing a significant amount uh, more information, even information that's quite confidential. Uh, and I just wanted to point that out to you, that there's different levels of maturity in, in supply chains, and it takes time to develop those. So you don't want to be sharing all of your information on day one. It takes time because information leakage is one of the biggest risks that, uh, that companies uh, have today. So this is the new supplier challenge. So imagine your company is looking for a strategic partner to manufacture widgets. And company A has got a long history of manufacturing quality widgets and always delivering on time and at low cost. But the problem here is that management has been accused of unethical behaviors, such as treating employees or contractors poorly, and not being entirely truthful with partners and customers about business operations. So that's company A. Now company B has got no history or experience in manufacturing uh, the widgets, but they do, uh, and they're not the most reliable partner for other products in the past. However, the leadership is known for dealing in an honest and transparent manner on all aspects of the business. Now think about this for a moment. Which company would you choose? Company A or company B? And this is a key challenge. So when I ask uh, in workshops, 99% of people will pick company A. And then I ask them, why do you pick company A? And they say, well, that's how I get measured. I get measured on getting the right product, the right time, the right quality into the right place. I don't get measured on whether the company gets involved in bribery, slavery, corruption, or, uh, or chopping down forests. 
So I thought that was quite quite interesting because when you look at uh, when you look at these companies, they're deemed to have company A is deemed to have high competence and low integrity, and company B is deemed to have high integrity and low competence. Now I make sure I put that onto this two by two uh, uh, metric or, or framework just to give you an example of how this works. So competency is defined as technical skills, experience, and reliability, and integrity is defined as the motives, honesty, and character. So here you have company A, firm A, who's got uh, high integrity and uh, high competency and low integrity, and company B has got um, high integrity and low competency. Now, if we look at that in more detail, according to Keneally's studies, firm A has that competency-based trust, but it may lead to adverse selection. Now, adverse selection means essentially choosing the wrong partner. And ultimately, that may lead to high, higher transaction costs, especially when you're negotiating uh, an agreement. Because when you're negotiating an agreement, you want to try to, uh, to cater for all of the risks that you have in the supply chain. And if you look at uh, the post-contractual issues that you may have, it's what's called moral hazard. And with it, moral hazard is essentially about opportunism or cheating. And we talk here about two different issues. The first one is of hidden action or hidden behavior. So again, if the company is not transparent with you and you're relying on a third party to expose some of the things that they're doing like deforestation or corruption or bribery, or even sourcing from alternative sources, that may have a very damaging effect on the reputation of your company over time. So firm B has got integrity-based trust. <laughs> it may lead to lower transaction costs, especially in the upfront relationship because you're not worried about the putting in too many safeguards because they're always open and honest with you. And over time, uh, it may reduce the costs as well. Now the risk in here is that one slip up in honesty can undermine the relationship. Now again, which firm did you pick, firm A or firm B? So what Keneally tells us is based on an analysis of 37,000 uh, plus companies that integrity-based trust, in other words, firm B, uh, was 10 times more effective at reducing transaction costs over time. So that's quite a surprise for a lot of people when they realize that. And in fact, the latest uh, research from uh, one of the big analyst firms that looks at uh, trust also confirmed recently that integrity-based trust is about 75% of the, the uh, trust equation uh, in, with, with suppliers. So it's very interesting to, uh, to look at that. So what I call food trust then has got two enemies. The first one is bad character and the second one is bad data. It's impossible to eliminate bad character, but it is possible to reduce the bad data. And on the left-hand side here, firms must start thinking like a criminal to try to reduce it. On the right-hand side, firms need to start looking at GS1 standards, which are absolutely critical to help solve the data problem. So let's go on to technology complexity. There's a lot of things in here, democratization, which means we're getting the technology out to more users. You have companies, billion dollar companies who are using $50 a month software and doing amazing things with it. We're talking now about decentralization and disintermediation are taking out the middleman. And we're also talking about convergence of technologies as it's certainly when we move towards society 5.0, but we have the risk of mass surveillance and privacy breaches. So on, on the bottom here, we can, we can go into, we could go into each of these individually and have fantastic discussions. But for the sake of this morning, I'm just gonna talk about blockchain and I'll look at it from different angles. So these are the things that we hear about blockchain. We hear about it being a trusted protocol. It's unhackable, verifiable, it's, crypt it's cryptographic. Uh, it can track your transactions and it's very secure. We also hear about smart contracts, encryption and trust all wrapped up together. Now my caution here is to watch out because blockchain does not imply smart contract. Uh, smart contracts is a separate concept. And in fact, smart contracts predates Bitcoin blockchain by 11 years and many banks and insurance companies are already using smart contracts. So smart contracts is not, uh, it doesn't have an umbilical cord with blockchain and blockchains can use it. And in fact, a lot of the benefits coming from blockchain deployments today are allegedly uh, because of smart contracts. But again, you don't need a blockchain to implement a smart contract. Encryption, as you know, is uh, predates Bitcoin blockchain by, by, by many years. Encryption is part of the cryptography family. 
And of course, uh, we have many people that are out there that are quite brilliant at doing that. And of course, trust is one of the things that we can expect from, uh, from blockchain deployments. However, if we look at this research that came out just last week, a few uh, professors looked at this. And if you look at the red line that I have here, we have seen very few successful implementations of blockchain technology in supply chains. And they also say that little is empirically known about the obstacles to blockchain adoption, particularly in supply chain interorganizational settings. So that's just a, uh, this is the latest research. So this research would have been done uh, last year and it's been published right now. What they also have in that uh, document is something I think is maybe useful for you. The promised benefits are on the left-hand side here, improved transparency, security information, improved sharing and trust of the data, improved operational performance. And then the obstacles on the right-hand side, and I had a look at these ob obstacles versus the obstacles that were identified in 2018, and it hasn't changed very much. So culture is an issue, the necessity of it, do I really need it? Do I have confidence in the technology? Information sharing remains a key issue. The technology itself, is it mature enough? The cost, the regulatory issues and privacy. And of course, there is still the umbilical cord between cryptocurrency and blockchains. And we need to separate those out in order to move forward. Now, one of the unintended consequences of blockchain deployments that I've seen is it actually forces companies to improve their data governance. So let's look at some industry views. We know about the Walmart use case. Uh, the use case was product safety recall. And in scenario one, it took seven days to do a recall without blockchain. And magically in scenario two with all companies using blockchain, it took 2.2 seconds. Now that sounds fantastic. And we ran with that for about a year and we understood that. But last year, the Walmart executive, or the former Walmart executive who was running this uh, mentioned at uh, a conference in the US that the 2.2 seconds traced the mango back to Brazil. However, the actual provenance of the mango was uh, actually traced it back to Mexico, but the actual provenance was actually Brazil. So there again is, is possibly uh, the example of data provenance versus scientific provenance. And this is why we need to get under the covers to understand the true benefits that are being delivered. Nevertheless, this is a good, uh, a good use case. However, Subway had a different uh, scenario. They said blockchain isn't a silver bullet for them, and they don't see using blockchain exclusively as a successful approach. And they said the best approach is looking at the problem you're trying to solve and then finding a tool to solve that problem. And they also said that uh, traceability for traceability purposes, it's not yet mature enough for them. This is Gary Nowacki, CEO of Trace Games, one of the most mature companies out there. They've been around for about 12 years and they have 1,000 customer sites and 30,000 supplier sites, all in food and CPG. And what Gary said is they've asked their executives at their customers multiple times if they need a blockchain and the answer has been no up to now. So blockchain is not always the answer. And if you come in with a shiny thing and try to force it, you'll probably break something. And I'll come back to that in a few moments. This is Eric Westblom, CEO of ProVision Analytics, and they're an AI technology startup. They just made an announcement a few days ago uh, about getting 3.2 million uh, as an investment, and they don't see blockchain and QR codes as, uh, as effective for tracking food in supply chains. And they've looked at their app and they've uh, measured it against a typical blockchain, and you can see they're uh, alleging that it's 4,660 times faster and much, much lower operating costs. Now, while I mentioned these companies here, Walmart, um, uh, uh, ProVision, um, Trace Gains, and, uh, and, that's, and Subway, I have no relationship with any of these companies whatsoever. I'm just presenting this uh, data to you. So let's summarize all of that. So when the discussion comes to blockchain, there seems to be no real middle ground. It's either hyping or it's bashing. And we know that most folks were focused on uh, the crypto side and not, a, not so many were focused on understanding blockchain itself. So for some, it's either a silver bullet and for others, it's a load of bullshit. Now, what Professor Hannah Halliburton says, she's at New York Stern University, she's a former Harvard and former economist at the Bank of Canada. And she says that optimism in the face of novelty and uncertainty about new technology is not a new phenomenon. 
but it does affect the economy. And essentially what she's saying is that when you have these fantastic uh, um, uh, proclamations of savings and, uh, and disruption caused by a technology, when, it, when there's no delivery on the actual results, verifiable results, then that can be damaging to, uh, to society or to the economy. So that's something to watch out for. This is my version of where blockchain is right now. Uh, it's got a head, so we know where it's going. It's got an ass, so we know where it ends. But we don't yet have the use cases to, to, to figure out if this is really a horse or it's a donkey or, or a camel. So we do need more use cases that are proven that we can uh, put more meat to the bone, as it were, on this. What I also like is this uh, two professors from Harvard um, who, who pointed out that we should not be seeing blockchain as disruptive. Blockchain is foundational. Um, and if we see it as foundational, we need, to, we need to have patience because it will take time. It may take decades to actually implement it. But they also claim that when we do implement it, it will have unprecedented societal changes. So now we get into the tips and tools. Understanding the five pillars of the food system, this is going to help you a lot as you look at uh, different projects. Because if you don't look at it this way, you'll just see food as just one big sector and one big problem to solve. This framework that I've developed here, building on other work, uh, helps you to understand what are the problems in food quality? What are the issues in food safety? How do you deal with food fraud? What is food defense and what is food security? For those of you not familiar with the terminology around food security, this is the ongoing supply of safe, affordable, nutritious foods to meet our daily needs. It's not the security of the shipment. Food defense is counterterrorism. Think of in, in intentional uh, issues here where somebody's trying to make you ill or trying to kill people. That's food defense. So we don't talk about that a lot and we don't publish a lot on that because that's really our secrets. We don't want the bad guys to know what we're doing in that area. So the tools and technologies that we use to protect ourselves uh, uh, from attack, uh, we, we don't talk about, but every company needs to protect themselves from that and every country does as well. Food fraud or food authenticity, again, if you're trying to apply blockchain or AI, uh, it's going to be very, very different in there versus what's needed in, uh, in food quality. So watch out for that. If you use the five pillars, it will help you to frame uh, the problem that you're going after. And I'm going to show you this model here. This is, I've been using this for over 25 years. You have a business view of a solution. So what do I want to build? What kind of a solution is this? What will it do for my business? Now, each of these six views here, when we're doing uh, uh, assignments with clients, each of these views breaks out into a full page of questions that we go through. I didn't put them in here for, for uh, expediency purposes, but each one of these has a lot of questions that goes into a lot of detail. So on the technical side, how will it be built? On the functional view, what will it give us when we're finished? What will we be able to do with it? On the implementation view, with what will we build it? When will we build it? When will it go live? The standards view, what local, national, or international standards should it apply to, apply with? On the policy view, what regulations and policies? If we're building a solution here in, let's say, in Canada or the US, and we're exporting products to other countries, how, can, how do we manage for that? If you do that, you'll avoid this. About 80% of technology projects end up failing for some reason. They're either over cost, uh, they, they run over cost, uh, or they don't deliver to the specification. So what, watch, out for, uh, watch out for that. If you use this model, I think it'll be very helpful for you. The other model I have is PDIM. Every, for every project you need to plan, you need to design, you need to implement, and you need to manage. And coming up with a vision is often very, very hard. And vision drives your strategy which drives your business process and your techn technical architecture. What I would recommend to organizations is to start with a proof of concept with whatever technology it is, because when you start with a proof of concept, it actually helps you to define your vision, uh, refine your strategy, and also define your business processes and technical architecture. <clears throat> and I build the model here just to show you how that works. It's an iterative model. And even when you get into the support and manage of a technology platform, you still need to go back to your vision on a regular basis. Now, the reality check here is that 80% of change will be at the information and business process level. And 80% of your time in technology projects will involve finding, cleaning, and structuring the data.
Another tool that you can uh, possibly use, this is from uh, Trevor Clohessy, and Trevor works with us uh, delivering webinars as well. Trevor is based in, uh, in Ireland, and he's got an ebook with 10 modules of learning materials that comes behind that. So we can do it with uh, Trevor as well uh, for clients. So this is a very useful uh, tool. Each module or each uh, uh, topic here is about 30 minutes delivery with about 15 minutes questions and answers. So quite a useful tool. Also supply chain and blockchain material, learning materials that's available. There's some great materials available at uh, the WEF World Economic Forum. And I put some additional materials down at the bottom here. And on the bottom right is one of the papers that I've co-authored in uh, a highly ranked journal. It's on Bitcoin, blockchain and fintech. This is a very unusual paper because it's a literature review, a systematic literature review. So it's about 100 pages. And it's really like a Bible. Uh, and it's a great reference document as well because it goes through all of the, the three main areas, Bitcoin, blockchain and fintech. And it looks at the definitions that are out there, the language that's being used and so on. And it, we also have three use cases in there of uh, blockchain being used in the food chain. So maybe useful for you to source those documents. Webinars, panels, and uh, advisories. This is what we do. This, uh, this session today is one of the, uh, the webinars that uh, we, we offer. We started these about a year ago. Uh, they're also customizable, customizable. Next week, we're doing an expert panel discussion, and we also do the client advisory. So an example, uh, supply chain management. We have a number of, uh, of webinars that we, we do on uh, introduction to GS1 standards. Uh, this one on supply chain transparency and trust. Uh, also on food fraud uh, and so on and so forth. On analytical science, we also have a series of uh, webinars coming up on, on this where we're working with uh, analytical chemists from all over the world. One of those is Source Certain in Australia where we're going to do education on uh, what is the analytical food science needed that underpins transparency and trust in the food chain. Again, going back to that very, very first slide, how do we prove something is organic? How do we test for, uh, for heavy metals in products? These are the things that we want to help educate uh, a lot of organizations on. And we also have uh, digitization and uh, complex ecosystems uh, organizational preparedness, and on the right, a uh, leadership panel on uh, COVID-19, which we were doing next week for several governments and uh, industry. So in summary, managing transparency and trust. This is bringing together uh, Hofstadter's three levels of transparency on the left, with Shapiro's three levels of uh, trust on the right. Now, different uh, model of trust than what you saw earlier, but very similar. The key message here is that history-based transparency and calculus-based trust are, are obligatory. They're forced on you. So regulations are down here. B2B contracts are down there. But the basis of that is mistrust. And what I call that is RMT, or regulation-mediated transparency. But as you go up the supply chain, or you go up this chart here to strategic transparency and identification-based trust, that's when you can start uh, looking at technologies that you can, uh, you can uh, utilize. And I'm sure that Walmart sat down with the mango suppliers and talked about developing the market and then making sure that uh, they bring a safe uh, and affordable product to consumers in the US. So this is a mismatch here. Uh, for example, if you're trying to do strategic transparency, but you're still focused on calculus-based trust, which is basically managing the risk, you're trying to contract yourself out of the problems, so you're trying to build trust into a contract, that just won't work. The key message here is that you have to mature transparency and trust at the same time. So my summary points, transparency is no longer optional. Transparency and trust must be matured together. Technology does not replace natural science. Don't lead with technology, figure out what the problem is. Data and information quality is critical to success and GS1 standards are essential. Industry-wide proprietary platforms are not the solution. Standards-based interoperability is key. And current regulations are part of the problem. So the one up, one down concept is actually outdated and it's holding us back today. So consider how to utilize the five pillars of the food system, the six views of the house analogy that I showed you, and the PDIM framework, plan, design, implement, manage. If you follow these, it'll be, uh, I think, very helpful for you to structure and execute on your projects. 
So thank you for that. And now I'm going to go over to Karen, who's going to talk about, uh, who's going to look at the questions and we're going to do the Q&A. So thank you, John. That was a really wonderful um, presentation. And I think there's a lot of key takeaways from this, um, especially I think what stood out for me was the importance of the integrity trust um, in the supply chain and building that that the take home message that technology is a tool, it is not an objective, that's very important. Disruptive technologies aren't defined by the technology, but by the context in which they are deployed. As you rightly pointed out, blockchains are not disruptive, but when applied to uh, digital currencies, for example, then you do have disruption. And thank you for all the great uh, resources that you've uh, supplied us the, to look um, and create further um, experiences and knowledge. So, um, any questions? Um, I'm looking at the chat room. I don't see anything specifically right now. Is there anybody that like to join in with a specific question on the content? I'm not sure, John, if you're seeing anything. I'm not seeing any Good afternoon. Good Hi afternoon. there. Hi, this is Mugdim Kudic from the Netherlands. Good all, good day to all you, to all, all of you. Hi, Mugdim. Hi, thank you for inviting me to the webinar and uh, quite interesting, uh, definitely the field of uh, supply chain and uh, color re the relation of blockchain. Um, I myself I am already working for 16 years in this field, uh, logistics and supply chain and found of the new technology, at least, well, new uh, meaning of, of using blockchain and different uh, um, technologies. Like you said, smart contracts are not new, but they are, uh, it's a link between a few things. And you mentioned something. I, my personal thought on all of this is, is basically like we're all talking about trust. Trust as how I see it uh, using supply chain and connecting it to all, uh, let's say, areas, you know, the whole supply chain of a specific product or area. When I look at this, I see it as an ecosystem where the first layer is the trust between buyers and suppliers, because these are the, the initial, let's say, uh, traders in the, in, the, in, the, in the supply chain. But of course, you need to link these things to, let's say, farmers and uh, to companies, uh, let's say also uh, from A to Z, till the end consumer. The end consumer is the person that is probably maybe benefiting it from getting a bit of reassurance and trust once they buy a product where they can scan a QR code and look at the product. Okay, say, okay, these avocados came from Mexico or came from Brazil, but it's, it's basically blockchain, I see it will be used more for the ecosystem of payments and trust because I think nowadays it's becoming even more important, uh, especially in this situation where this uh, crisis has gone uh, uh, and reached all of us and, 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 and companies are are let's say keen on even nowadays for will I get paid once I purchase something will my uh, supplier deliver the goods to me that's one point but two is will I get the payment you know from 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 the specific buyer and, and seller and I think by creating an ecosystem where uh, trust is, is is only maybe my personal view would be like an ecosystem where you would everybody would supposed to donate a certain amount of money or something in this pool and using blockchain and smart contracts and specific technologies you can create a, a sort of utopia. Utopia maybe sounds crazy, but I mean, that's maybe the future where we are reassured that we will get paid for the, the services that we provide. And then of course you link these things to the suppliers, farmers, and everybody can use this data for analytics or maybe reinsurance or yeah, things like that. That's at least my thought on, on this whole uh, concept. And Okay, thanks, and uh, thanks Putin for that. I see there's a question from, uh, from Paul. Uh, how do we apply the concept of blockchain when there's a severe event like uh, like COVID, where I assume impacts uh, various supply chains? Can it be used to identify supply chain issues and used to identify solutions? So, Paul, that's a great question, and thank you for asking that. Um, we have looked at uh, various technologies to address. Uh, Karen and I have been involved in uh, a think tank for the last month at um, trying to figure out what kind of technologies do we need? Now, blockchain is not uh, the shiny thing that we're bringing to the table, nor is any other technology for that matter. 
um, what we're looking at is what are the problems that, that arise when you have a, a crisis like COVID. And one of the, one of the key issues is, um, is identifying those problems and looking at how do you solve those problems. So I heard a really creative solution coming up, uh, which does actually use blockchain where it links to the identity of the person and links to a, a medical record uh, that verifies that they have been tested and they're cleared or they have the antibody. So there's work going on right now um, that looks at how can you use uh, blockchain uh, to link to uh, the medical records or the test results um, that, can, that can help. But on the supply chain side, uh, the biggest issue we have is the lack of digitization and Blockchain won't work in a crisis because the biggest problem we have today is we have a lot of dirty data in the in the food chain and the industry has to clean up their act uh, before we can uh, address those issues. So that, that is a big, uh, big problem. So I'm going to look at uh, uh, some more questions here. There's a uh, really good question, John, about um, um, culture as an element that needs to be addressed to develop more successful transparency. And if you could speak to that a bit more and the role that blockchain can or cannot play in culture and the development of that transparency. Yeah, so for the benefit of, uh, of the listeners today, uh, I actually academically research uh, transparency and trust for the last uh, six years, as well as uh, advising on it. And a culture of transparency is critically important. Uh, however, even within a company, you will have different subcultures and you have to be careful. If you remember, remember what I talked about earlier with some companies will uh, push from a PR side or marketing side to talk about the brilliant things they're doing in CSR and getting that information out there. Unfortunately, what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing is that information that's going out from uh, corporate CSR or marketing is actually not fully aligned with operations. So they may not know what's going on. They may be just interpreting an internal report but they probably have not been out in the field to look at the risks or vulnerabilities that are out there. So I think uh, a top-down approach to transparency and broadcasting that uh, for CSR purposes, it can and it is backfiring for a lot of companies. So a culture of, uh, of transparency is very, very similar to the notions of the, the culture of, uh, of uh, the food safety culture. And it's about behavior. So the behavior in trans from, from a transparency perspective is knowing which information is confidential to the company that you cannot share, and then knowing what you can share and with whom. Because a desire to know something does not give someone the right to get it. So if a consumer wants to know more about a product, there are certain aspects of, uh, of the product or information that they have no right to know about. So th this is a very, very important uh, notion and when we get into uh, blockchain, um, blockchain it can be very useful for areas like, uh, like environmental or sustainability. But the issue with that, as I mentioned earlier, is transparency is viewed as a threat in some countries. So you have developing countries with, uh, with regimes that may be uh, top down, it may be uh, dictatorial, it may be a socialist economy or even a, a, you know, a, a developed economy who do not want to share information about the environmental footprint. Um, so, so that is part of the problem. So there's the political side of transparency and there's uh, within the business. And I think within businesses, they're not necessarily joined up. So if you do put in a blockchain uh, and you do talk about immutability, it poses a risk. And a lot of companies, a lot of organizations may say, you know what, we're not ready for that yet. Thank you, John. Um, there is a question here about reliable sources or companies that rate trust and transparency. I would like to point out that from a farmer perspective, it's always been an issue of farmers signing contracts with service providers and not understanding what happens to their data, the rights of what that data is um, providing to companies or to themselves or even being able to get it back in an electronic format. One of the initiatives that has started in the US and now adopted through Farm Credit Canada here in Canada is the Ag Data Transparency Initiative. And really it's not a company, but they have a third party agricultural lawyer that looks at contracts between service providers and farmers and gives it a housekeeping 
uh, seal of approval, so to speak, based on 10 principles of data stewardship or ownership. But I'd like to point out in that case, the lawyer, uh, Todd Jansen, if you want to follow him, very interesting, does work with companies to help them with their data governance strategies. So it's not meant to be a punitive approach. It's meant to be a collaborative approach. And I'll let John answer the other part. Are there other companies that he knows of outside of the example I gave in primary ag? Well, the, I, what I referred to earlier, I didn't mention the company name, but the Edelman Trust Barometer. Uh, Edelman have been producing a trust barometer for the last 20 years, and their latest one, which is freely available online, Edelman, E-D-E-L-M-A-N, Edelman Trust Barometer, it gives you a great breakdown of uh, aspects of trust in uh, B2B. Uh, it also looks at uh, government, uh, NGOs, uh, media, and industry, so the four pillars of society. Uh, but companies that go in specifically and measure it, it's, uh, it's a very immature area right now. I would say from a data perspective, uh, one of the best organizations that I know that helps with data is GS1, and in particular GS1 Canada, who manages, uh, I think, about 750,000 products on behalf of Canadian industry. And one of the best examples of how to manage the data, control the access to the data, and keep the, the data synchronized. About eight or nine years ago, uh, GS1 UK uh, did a project where it's called Data Crunch. So this is uh, Googleable uh, Data Crunch. And they found uh, between the four top manufacturers and the four top retailers, they found, I think it was about 1% consistency of data. And that was sized at between 500 and $700 million or million pounds of uh, inefficiencies over a five year period that would have been passed on to consumers. So this is very important to have that data synchronization within the country. And when you do that, you need to be able to identify the difference between master data, transactional data, and event data, and also the authoritative source versus the custodian source. And these are things that are not very well understood by most industry players today. And the GS1 organization can be very helpful in helping organizations to understand that notion of the data creator being the authoritative source, and the data users or consumers, whether they're systems or other platforms, being the custodian and how to keep that all in sync. That is actually part of one of our webinars as well, if anyone is interested in that. We have two minutes left, uh, Karen, maybe a quick question. Yeah, there's uh, two questions. Uh, we know that there's complexity everywhere and how do we create cl clarity from complexity? And we know that we're going to address that in further webinars. Um, and a lot of it is around what you spoke of today and the governance of the system and the readiness of the ecosystem, which really relates to the last question about um, how do you get companies to embrace that um, more transparent approach uh, my comment would be that often I see immune responses within companies when it comes to technologies and transparency. So they may hive it off into a small division that might be exploring alternative options to collabor collaborations or co-opetition as whatever you want to label it. But we need to bring it up into the board and be more, more um, engaged at the business strategy level. And I'll let uh, John comment on that. Yeah, just very briefly, I would say that uh, transparency and trust uh, has little to do with, uh, with technology and all it has to do with culture. And uh, it needs to be embraced uh, by the organization as a whole and certainly from leadership. Um, I think organizational leaders need to explain what is transparency in context of their organization. What information is, uh, is private? Uh, is there corporate secrets? What information is shared with their business partners and for why? and what information is shared with consumers and how do they protect their IP, their know-how, their recipes and so on. These are very, very important things. So there's a cultural component to this and it's everybody's business within a company, just like, like privacy is and security, it's everybody's business. So uh, maybe we'll leave it at that, Karen, uh, because we're at uh, 10 o'clock. So what I'd like to do is thank Karen for moderating today and thank uh, everyone for, for joining. We will send you a copy of the recording. And if you have any questions, uh, you can come directly into me uh, or into uh, to Karen as well. Um, that's it, so thank you very much and thank you, Karen. Thank you, John, and thank you everyone for attending. Mm -hmm.